Yeah. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Welcome back once more for Genesis Apologetics, should apologize, this time part 7. It seems like it's been a while since we all gathered around the dark crystal I keep on set and talked about how badly wrong Genesis Apologetics can get science. Since that's the case, my lawyers have informed me that I should remind you that the Dapper Dino channel accepts no responsibility for any damages to person or property as a result of face palming, face desking, monitor punching, or any other acts of frustration born of watching this video or any related video. It is also recommended that you acquire some calming agent and safety gear. I recommend a Dapper Onset brand pillow, which is available in my merch store, link in the description. Okay, now that we have the legal stuff out of the way, let's dive back into the stupid. Is it just me, or is natural selection kind of blind when it comes to evolution? Well, natural selection is blind to the future and the past. It only selects based on the current environment and current genome of an animal. And as these two things change, so does the manner in which it operates. We better get to studying. What are we studying today? Natural selection. I've already started reading it. There's a great definition in our biology textbook. So, natural selection is the process by which organisms with variation most suited to their local environment survive and leave more offspring. I guess that's an okay definition. Doesn't really give you much to go on, but it's not really wrong. So, evolutionary theory holds that natural selection is one of the forces that drives evolution? How's that work? Well, evolutionists say a mutation happens in the sex cells of a creature, and its offspring exhibits the resulting trait difference, like a new feather color or something. The trait can give it an advantage or a disadvantage. A beneficial mutation would cause it to become a little better at surviving in an environment than the non-mutants. So, its descendants, and thus the trait, eventually outnumber the others. Then the scenario repeats with another variation, supposedly driving evolution forward. Hey, this is pretty spot on. A little simplified and with more focus on survival than differential reproductive success, but still not bad. But rather than this process producing just the varieties we see among animal kinds, they believe this process built those animals from completely different ones. And then you go off the rails. First, since you're never going to define kinds, I should really just replace everything you say about them with a sensor tone, since everything you say about that is completely meaningless until you do. Further, all organisms are descended from organisms that resemble them at fundamental levels, and the changes are always successively more superficial as you progress through time in the history of evolution, so there never was a time when one organism gave rise to a fundamentally different one. It can eventually lead to one kind of animal turning into another but this has never been observed. Nice use of the wolf and whale to imply that one might evolve into the other, or that whales evolve from wolves, neither of which is true. But again, there are no kinds until you can give objective criteria that allow anyone to identify at least some of them unambiguously. For example, that wolf and whale are both ferungulatans. So are they the same kind? I don't know, and neither do you. Fish are still fish, and finches are still finches. And since that fish and that finch are both osteichthians, are they both fish? I mean, the taxon literally means bonefish. If you're going to have a discussion about a technical matter, maybe use the technical terms. Fish doesn't mean anything in biology. And here in the biology textbook, they point out that the polar bear had the advantage as a predator in the snow because of its white coat. And it also shows that if you start with yellow and green grasshoppers, two different traits inherited from the parents, the green may outnumber the yellow in a green environment because they are harder for birds to see and catch. So, did the grasshoppers think through how other animals would avoid it if it looked more camouflaged? Did it know how to genetically engineer itself to express those colors? Did a polar bear engineer its own white coat? No, you already went over this earlier. These things are variations brought about by essentially random mutations. It just so happens that the animals in question lived in environments where certain variations were beneficial. Natural selection has no foresight or will. No, but that's not what evolutionists believe. They think that these changes happen randomly in the DNA, influencing an individual's survivability. Evolution is a blind process, no offense. No offense to whom? Evolution? Blind people? I mean, I'm offended by the dishonesty of the writers, although I'm withholding judgment on the actors since I have no way of knowing their level of involvement with that dishonesty or their level of actual belief in any of this. Intelligent choices supposedly have nothing to do with it. Evolutionists believe natural selection figured out how to design an eye. But how? 
It would have to build and preserve over who knows how many generations hundreds of complicated interacting eye parts, including proteins that were all useless until the whole package was eventually assembled. Well, let's start with a nice single-celled ancestor to animals. Since all animals, even sponges, have some level of photosensitivity, or are at least descended from animals that did, such as blind cavefish, it's reasonable that if they all shared a single-celled ancestor, it too may have had some photosensitivity. This can be handy for things like knowing which way is up or regulating circadian cycles. Since light can transfer energy to molecules, and this can in some cases be enough to alter the molecule, all that's needed for basic photosensitivity is a chemical that is sensitive to some wavelengths of light, and for the change in that chemical to be seen in the cell as some sort of signal. Essentially, it acts as a hormone. But with the advent of a neural net, the hormone in question can also trigger a neural response if there is a mutation causing the reception of light to trigger the release of a neurotransmitter by the cell detecting the light. At this point, there is a selection pressure for a cell type to evolve that specializes in this, and so we can see the emergence of eye spots, like are seen in modern flatworms. Eye spots are simple patches of light-sensitive cells and do little more than measure the ambient light levels in a creature's environment. Still, this helps with knowing the time of day, which way is up, and if the animal is in the shadow of something, it can trigger an evasion response since that shadow might be a predator. Obviously, this is better than a few scattered photoreceptors. Of course, directional information about light is even better for an animal to have, and so there is a selection pressure to form a depression in which the photosensitive cells sit. This will allow the animal to more precisely determine the direction of light. And this is the beginning of image formation. If the opening to this depression narrows, the directional information becomes more precise, although at the cost of lowering the amount of light hitting the cells. So now, there is a pressure for the cells to become more sensitive, perhaps through production of more of the chemical that is interacting with the light, as well as for the opening of the eye to become narrower. Eventually, you have a pinhole eye, like that of a nautilus. This is the first image-forming eye, although it cannot really vary its focal length, and it receives much less light from the environment than other eyes. The next step for natural selection is to favor any mutation that puts any clear tissue in a glob at the entrance to the eye. This will tend to focus light toward the eye, making more light available. At this point, there is also pressure to fill in the space in the eye with some clear substance, so as to provide physical strength. Now we have a basic eye with a lens, some kind of clear humor, and a retina. Of course, during this whole time, muscles may have been developing around the eye, since being able to move the eyes has obvious advantages. Now the lens is free to grow bigger and allow more and more light in, constrained by how big the eyes can be before it becomes too energy intensive or injury prone to maintain. Also, any muscles that form a sphincter around the lens can effectively change the exposure level to keep the picture well lit, and prevent damage to the retina from excessive light exposure. Similarly, various muscles can flex the lens, allowing the animal to focus at different points in the distance. So yeah, the only question about this is whether these are things that mutations can produce. I can't see why they couldn't be. Even creationists accept that mutations can cause changes in the physical structure of organisms. So which of these changes are impossible for a mutation to produce, and why? How'd it know to engineer animals for flight? Am I really going to have to give explanations for all of this? Yes, you are. Okay, fine. Most bilaterians can control to some degree the manner in which they fall if and when they do in fact fall. This can be as simple as landing on their feet, or even some limited ability to choose a landing spot. Any feature, such as a membrane of skin between the fingers, or integument stretching out of the tail or arms, can help increase this ability, forming a glide. Flapping motions can add energy to a glide, and the aerodynamic surfaces can undergo a series of simple adaptations for more efficient gliding. Increases in flexibility and muscle power for flapping downstrokes can also increase the efficiency of a glide. And once that efficiency goes past 100%, such that the animal can add energy to their glide faster than they lose it, even for a small time, that is powered flight. Since nothing about this is outside the realm of mutations and natural selection, flight isn't a problem for natural selection. Or a navigation system so tiny it can fit in the head of a monarch butterfly, which is smaller than a pin. Monarch butterflies use a combination of chemoreception and geomagnetism for navigation. So they know about which direction to go because they know which way north and south are. And when they're close to their target, they can smell where to go. Chemoreception is common to all life, so there's not much need to explain that. But all that's really needed for geomagnetic sense is a small bit of magnetic material and the ability to sense which way it's getting pushed, which can be done by simply encasing it in some pocket of flesh that has nerves around it so you can feel where it's being pushed. That's actually pretty simple, and from there you can refine it. As for how small it is, so what? It's not any harder than making legs so tiny that they fit on a little butterfly. How'd it wire a human brain that's far more complicated than our best computers if it is a totally blind process with no goal or purpose in view? 
constant selection pressure for more intelligence, since it was more expedient for a certain group of apes to get smarter rather than stronger, since the animals in their environment were already much stronger and more dangerous on a physical level than they were, but were also much less intelligent. The human brain is different by degrees from that of other mammals. It has all the same parts as a shrew brain, but just in much different proportions and is much bigger compared to the size of the animal. Other than that, there are known and identified mutations that have caused human neurotransmission to differ somewhat, but again, this is a matter of degree, not of kind. Humans have the same kind of brain as chimpanzees, and both of them fundamentally have the same kind of brain as a cow. You're right! Natural selection is just a process. It doesn't have a brain. It can't think or design. It had no foreknowledge of what it was trying to accomplish. And yet, coupled with mutations, it's been assigned godlike powers to create things way beyond man's understanding. Well, yes, because as long as you have a source of new variation, there's no reason for natural selection to stop working on the variation. So assuming constantly directional or changing selection pressures in an environment, there's no particular limit to the degree to which any given population can vary over time. And so large-scale changes can occur to the morphology of any given organism. And as far as man's understanding, at one point man didn't understand that lightning was the discharge of static electrical charges built up in the clouds. That didn't mean that it wasn't static electrical charges, or that the formation of lightning was magical. Because humans don't understand something doesn't mean that the first supernatural explanation you get to is right. It just means you don't understand something. That's all. Yes! It's like they've replaced God's power with random mutations and natural selection. Well, they kind of did. What was once directly ascribed to a supernatural cause because it wasn't understood is now understood, and so there's not much reason to ascribe a direct magical cause to it. It's not my or science's problem that your conception of God requires that processes that aren't magical exclude him as a causative agent. But since that's how you think of God, unfortunately for you, he will have less and less to do in the universe as science grows, and the fact that that challenges your childish theology is no excuse for your attempting to hinder or stop scientific progress, lest your god shrink once more. As the textbook points out, it favors a creature's overall ability to survive, but the actual changes are happening deep down in the creature on a microscopic level inside the genes. Right. And? Wait, 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 wait. So, you're saying that when certain individuals die, all their genes just go away? Unless they've passed them on to offspring, then yes, that's sort of the point. Meaning that natural selection has no power in selecting individual genes? Well, it can't see genes, just whole organisms. Yup, that's why there are things like linkage groups. Fortunately, linkage groups can be broken up, and so a chromosome that gets both a beneficial and a harmful mutation can, in the process of reproduction, swap out parts of that chromosome so that one chromosome has the beneficial mutation and its opposite the harmful, which can then lead to the beneficial mutation proliferating without the harmful one. But all that's really required for this to not be a problem is for beneficial mutations to outweigh any linked harmful mutations, which isn't hard for them to do. Also, natural selection is supposed to mean survival of the fittest. No, it's not. That's a phrase derived from a layman who liked evolution back in the 19th century. Natural selection is really about differential reproductive success as a result of heritable variation. Granted, that's a bit clunky and not very catchy, but it has the virtue of being true and accurate. But hey, why would that be important for science, right? But what if <clears throat> someone, nobody in particular, you know, had their eyes dilated and was leaving when they knocked over the fish tank in the waiting room? You did. Anyway, if exactly half of them died because I d they didn't get them in the water, was it survival of the fittest? No. Assuming that that fish tank held a reproducing fish population, which I'll just grant you, even though it probably didn't, then that would be genetic drift, which is the name for the non-selective and stochastic aspect of evolution. No one is saying that that's natural selection, because the change in allele frequency in the post-knockover fish tank wasn't due to selection for beneficial phenotypes. <laughs> no, it was survival of the luckiest. Yeah, well... <clears throat> Here's a picture of two mutant flies and a normal one. Which one do you think is the most likely to survive in a particular environment? It depends. A is probably good in most environments, but then the other ones with the shriveled wings may actually be favored in an environment where finding food is not terribly difficult, but where high wind makes big wings the sort of thing that might actually cause problems. There are in fact species of insects that despite being in clades that have wings, have atrophied or even absent wings because in their environment, wings were a disadvantage. None of them. When I hit him with my fly swatter. Alright, 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 the normal one would probably survive best. But it depends on the environment, right? Right, so let's see how badly we can mess this up. Yeah, 
So evolution that turns a simpler organism into a fruit fly relies on mutants becoming better able to survive as new genetic information is added and then surviving to pass their genes onward. Oh goody, we're going to use the word information as a buzzword without ever defining it or showing how we measure it. It's like the last episode all over again. Suffice it to say, using the word information this way is meaningless, and so your whole last sentence could just as well have been a series of long fart noises for all that was actually said. Mutants are usually worse off since most mutations are harmful, and natural selection actually cleanses the population by killing the less fit mutants. No, most mutations are neutral and don't have any effect whatsoever on the phenotype. Further, what you're showing are conjoined twins, which is not the result of mutation. It's a result of improper separation of growing monozygotic embryos in utero. Conjoined twins, whether human or otherwise, are not genetically distinct as such. This might help keep the most effective traits within a population. So the real world works exactly opposite of what evolution requires. Bingo! No, it acts exactly as evolution requires in every detail. Your willful inability to even give a proper account for how evolution is supposed to work is not an argument against it. And while lots of small mutations can give a survival advantage in specific environments... Oh, so now you admit that reality does work the way that evolution requires? Nice own goal. Virtually all the real-life examples show a loss of genetic information, not a gain. Evolutionists have tried to propose various genetic explanations, like gene duplication, but they're putting their faith in a process that has never actually been observed. Are you saying that gene duplication hasn't been observed? It has been observed in real time, and the evidence of it happening in the past is replete in the literature. Just Google Scholar search gene duplication, read the 730,000 peer-reviewed papers, and then tell me it's not a thing. You might as well say clouds aren't real. This isn't something that's up for debate. What's gene duplication? It's when a whole gene accidentally gets copied and then it mutates to become another new gene. Uh, no. <laughs> Not quite. The mutation part isn't the gene duplication. It's a thing that can happen afterwards, which conveniently leaves the organism in question with a perfectly good copy of the original gene. Nice story. Have scientists ever seen that happen? Nope. Never. You're wrong. It's so wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Well, that's just a straight up lie. And most examples of supposed evolution in action involve things like chemical pathways and small changes in proteins. But how do you get a fin to turn into a limb and then a human hand? Like this? And like this. Interestingly enough, fish fins and tetrapod limbs have deep homologies and are controlled by many of the same Hox genes. I recommend getting a copy of Neil Shubin's Finding Your Inner Fish if you want a deep but lay-level dive into how much of a fish you really are. They tell interesting stories about how it must have just happened. But I can't find any evidence it actually happened. The evidence that it happens is all around you. You obviously haven't even done a Google Scholar search on the topic. So I don't think you have looked. At best, you found out that people who already agreed with you didn't think it happened and weren't keen to point you to the mountains of evidence that it did. So you just figured that they were telling the truth. Because when has a purported man of God ever misled people? I mean, besides all those times in your own Bible when the religious leaders are the bad guys. This lets me bring up one of my favorite scenes in traditional Christian art. The final judgment as portrayed in Eastern Christian icons. At the bottom of the painting is typically a line of people about to go down to hell, and usually a very high proportion of them are clergy, bishops, priests, deacons, etc. Distrust for your religious leaders is a long-standing Christian tradition, one you would do well to reacquaint yourself with. Oh, I'm sorry. She just talked about mutations needing to increase information, but since as we've already established, that doesn't mean anything until information is defined in this context, any random noise will do just as well as her talking. And if you think about it, natural selection can't create anything. It can only deselect by killing whole individuals with traits that are already present in a population. A fact no one disputes. You're really hitting a home run with this one, guys. Wow, you're right. 
you can only select something that is already present. How could nature ever add information to some DNA by subtracting some of what is already there? Well, assuming we define information the only way I've ever seen for it to be defined, any mutation that isn't a deletion is adding information to the genome at the population level, and it may increase information at the organism level too, depending on the mutation. So it's not natural selection that does that. It's mutation. You know, like you already said you knew was the claim made by evolutionary biologists. Great question. And speaking of information, here's another question evolutionists have not even come close to answering. How could chemicals from early Earth spontaneously form molecules with information? You really like using words you've never defined, don't you? That's a stretch. So, natural selection can't do anything without mutations, and mutations can't even happen unless DNA forms from some muddy puddle billions of years ago. You got it. No, she doesn't. The formation of the first genetic material only has to have happened. How it happened is fundamentally irrelevant. If that's where you want to shove your god of the gaps, then I guess go ahead, but just be ready for him to shrink out of there too. There is no known mechanism for creating information like we find in DNA from simple matter. Information always comes from a mind. And God is the mind behind creating the DNA in the first place. Yeah! Well, that should be easy to demonstrate or disprove once you actually define information. Oddly though, creationists don't seem keen on doing so, even though, if they're right, that would be a big step towards proving their positions correct. If you're a creationist watching this, I humbly suggest you get on it. But the biggest problem I have with natural selection being able to create new kinds of animals is found right here in our biology textbook. Let me see if I can find it. You're starting to see really well. I am. Now, Charles Darwin is credited for discovering natural selection and describing how it led to the evolution of different animals and plants. Right here it tells the story. After reading Malthus, Darwin realized that if more individuals are produced than can survive, members of a population must compete to obtain food, living space, and other limited necessities of life. Darwin described this as the struggle for existence. Malthus? Oh, I remember him from history. He believed much of the world's problems were due to people reproducing faster than our food supply. Right. Yep, and Malthus was generally wrong about humans because they have a unique ability to increase the carrying capacity of the environment given enough technology and a rapid enough pace of technological innovation. He was decent at math and bad at economics. Moving on. Evolution claims that a never-ending chain of struggle and death is what created life. No, there can't be death before life. That's what shaped life into the various forms it has taken over the eons. At this point, they are just preaching, and since I don't allow that on my channel, this is where I will leave you all. The only other thing they really add is that evolution is a religion, and it's not. Thanks for watching. Before you go, I'd like to take a minute to thank my patrons, especially my $20 patrons, Ben Tovind, Bob Knob, The Evil Scotsman, Henry Hutanen, Chris Love, and Res Instance. If you'd like to help me make videos like this, why don't you head over to my Patreon? I have tiers starting as low as $1 and going all the way up to $100. You get access to my Discord, as well as some other exclusive items that only my patrons get to see. You also occasionally get early access to my videos. If a monthly subscription isn't right for you, but you'd still like to help out, you can check out my merch store or my Amazon.com wishlist, both of which are linked in the description. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. <laughs> Well,